welcome to What the Duck, a podcast with real experts talking about direct spin challenges and experiences. And now, here's your host, Source Day's very own manufacturing maven, Sarah Scudder. Thanks for joining me for What the Duck, another supply chain podcast brought to you by Source Day. I'm your host, Sarah Scudder, and this is the podcast for people working in the direct materials part of supply chain. I'm at Sarah Scudder on LinkedIn and at S Scudder on Twitter. If you are new to the show, make sure to follow this podcast so you don't miss any of our direct materials supply chain content. Today, I'm going to be joined by Craig Campbell. We're going to call him Double C, and we're going to discuss how to deal with global freight issues. If you work for a manufacturer dealing with hugely extended freight times and freight cost increases, then this episode is for you. Craig started his career with a defense contractor in Scotland, gaining an engineering qualification and then moved into purchasing. From there, he moved to an oil and gas materials supplier as a buyer and ultimately ended up as the head of supply chain where he, there, which resulted in his move from the UK to the US. Welcome to the show, Craig. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much for having me on. Uh, it's a work from home type day and a little bit of a tech issue day, but we made it work. We persevered. We're still smiling. So here we are. So Craig, let's go back in time and talk about the very, very early days of your career. Yeah. You actually started your career at as with, um, you, you started your career as a sub contract engineer. So would like to have you explain what is this and what did you do in this role? Okay, so yeah, um, you, you're right when you say you're going way back. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to remember it myself. <laughs> it's been that long. But basically at the time I worked for a, a huge defence contractor in the UK, they went through a massive transition um, for financial reasons and for contractual reasons they had to outsource pretty much 75 percent of their manufacturing so in order to do that they had to build a very strong very resourceful supply chain purchasing department uh, part of that was subcontract management and um, i was a young engineer in the company at the time and i was given the opportunity to move into this team and um, it was basically involving contacting suppliers about, um, well, sourcing parts that were previously made in-house um, and also measuring suppliers, starting the road, I guess, towards supplier scorecards and supplier business reviews. So a lot of metrics, a lot of um, supplier contact. And for me at the time, it was brand new for me. It was a fantastic um, introduction into dealing with external suppliers. So that was pretty much it. Yeah, so I don't have an engineering background and I, I don't know if I've ever actually heard that phrase subcontract engineer before. Yeah. So you started in engineering. We're gonna we're gonna call that as kind of your starter launch pad of your career. Why the pivot from engineering to purchasing? Well, you know, a lot of times over my career, I've been asked, how did you end up in purchasing? And my usual answer is I must have done something really, really bad in a previous life. <laughs> but but, but the actual fact is that um, at that time, it was career advancement for me. Um, it was an opportunity. It wasn't that I had any real passion or desire for purchasing. It was just an opportunity for career advancement. And it you know, whilst I joke about, you know, unfortunately ending up there, it's it's cemented a fantastic career in an industry and in a part of this, uh, the industry that I really, truly love. And I've travelled all over the world doing it and I've moved countries doing it. So um, it was never a plan, but it's funny how things work out. Speaking of not being a plan, I, I've talked about this in our launch episode for the podcast, but I actually used to do runway modeling and was planning to go into fashion 
and I actually wanted to produce fashion shows. And now here I am in direct materials procurement. Yeah. So I would have never, ever thought I would ever wind up in a purchasing or procurement or supply chain capacity. So you just never know what happens. I don't think any of us ever planned it or chose it. <laughs> we just fell into it. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons why I like to start off our podcast kind of talking about the start and the background because almost nobody that's come on the show has actually like majored in college in supply chain and actively right. pursued a career. They've always just kind of random hap chance, you know, fallen into the industry. Sure. So the other thing that I noticed from your background, Craig, is that you really kind of have this focus on direct materials versus indirect. Yeah. So why the passion for the, the direct materials portion of our industry? It's kind of similar to my previous answer in that um, it's what I was involved in. It's what I was put into. Now, after I started in that subcontract engineer position, I moved into a buyer position in the same company, started being involved in the commercial and direct execution of supply, um, which was a kind of natural progression. Uh, within that team, there was a very, very experienced um, buyer who dealt with all our indirect materials. And I have massive respect for anybody that deals with indirect materials because I saw day to day what that guy went through. He used to joke, you know, if the CEO doesn't have toilet paper, then, you know, it's just as bad as the, as the, as the line not having a casting, right? But um, but it's just, I think the, the thought of being able to make sure that production continues. Um, and also because I've got an engineering background and I've always been involved in the purchasing of engineering type components, then I'm much more mm -hmm. well-versed in talking to suppliers about these types of products. Yeah. I I started on the indirect side and I've come full circle now on the direct side and I love the direct side because it's high visibility, high priority and I feel yeah. like the executive team is more bought in into the the spend and to the strategy versus some companies indirect is kind of like a well nice to have or we'll get to it later. Yeah. Some company has what I've worked for indirect spend doesn't even go through the yeah. supply chain department. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've seen that uh, several times as well. So you were you were born and raised and started your career in the UK, and yeah. then you made your way over to the States. So how'd you end up in the US? So uh, I went on from um, my first company to a supplier of um, steel products to the oil and gas completion equipment industry. Um, it was a Scottish company a young company. At the time I joined them, they were only 30 years old um, and they were very successful. And they moved, they opened facilities in all the major oil and gas centers across the world. So they, they, they had a place in Houston, they had a place in Singapore, Norway, Canada, uh, Dubai. Um, I was with them for a long period of time in Scotland. Um, the company was bought over by a Japanese steel company who were headquartered in Houston and at that time I was moving into a corporate supply chain role and the new owners wanted to move our corporate headquarters from Glasgow to Houston mm. so they actually built a new uh, an extension to our Houston facility for our corporate headquarters so I was given the opportunity to make that move um, I had a young family at the time it was a it was a it was a massive um, decision, you know, um, but it, it turned out to be a good one. So that's how I ended up there. So you ended up in my now newer home state. I, I moved to Texas end of 2021 when I joined the Source Day team. Yeah. And it you spent about 10 years in yeah. Texas. Yeah. So what did you do? For those 10 years and why did you decide to stay for so long? Well for the majority of those 10 years um, I think maybe seven or eight of them I was in that um, head of supply chain role um, so uh, it was it was my job that kept me there initially 
Uh, when I moved on to that, I moved on to another couple of supply chain roles in the area. But by that time, um, my kids had gone through high school and moved on to college. Um, it, it turned out to be a really massive upheaval, moving them from Scotland to the US. And we wanted to keep stability in their lives, you know, having already made that one major move, it was important to keep a stable situation for them. So, um, but but that's one part of it. The other part of it is actually I love Texas. <laughs> I just do. I mean, it's the, the, the people of Texas and the state of Texas are very similar to the people of Scotland and the country of Scotland. Um, so, you know, I mean, other than the weather and you know, all the other things, but culturally, um, it was a great place to be. And I still love Texas. I am obsessed with Texas. I am so glad that I moved here. And I, I think it's the, the nicest people I've ever met yes. anywhere I've been are in Texas. And my second observation is everyone here has a dog. Yes. I might be the only petless person that I know. Oh, you have to have a dog. No dogs. I'm a neat freak. I don't like hair. Okay. But I, I, I moved into corporate housing when I started, and I swear I had never seen so many people out and about with dogs. Yeah. We actually um, moved our dog from Scotland to Texas. Wow. That was the most expensive part of the move. Meaning like special, I guess, crate and yeah. transportation. Yeah, his ticket would have been three three business tickets worth in terms of cost. Wow. <laughs> Part of the family. Absolutely. So as we're talking about your career progression, you it sounds like next move is you worked for a nuclear valve manufacturer. Right. So um, tell me a little bit about this role and what did you learn that you've been able to take with you in, in future positions? Okay, so that was when I left Texas and moved to North Carolina. By that time, both my kids were in college. Um, I was looking for new opportunities and it, they didn't necessarily have to be in the Houston area. A opportunity for a supply chain manager came up with this company. Um, it, was a, it was a great opportunity and I decided to, to make another move. Um, the, the issues with this company are very much, very much an engineered to order facility. So no two valves are the same. They're all very old design. Um, the nuclear industry has got, as you would imagine, and need incredibly stringent um, certification rules, a very narrow supply base because there's very few qualified suppliers to make the components. And I know we're going to move on to it further in the podcast, but it was here when we were going through the COVID issues and we were experiencing the freight issues. So um, they had an MRP system, they had planning, but pretty much everything was done, as we used to say in Scotland, on the back of a cigarette packet as opposed to using a system. It, ma like it makes me cringe because I think of post-it notes all over the wall exactly. or all over the computer. Exactly. It's very much like that. So the one thing I learned there is that you have to be adaptable, right? Every single supply chain, purchasing, procurement, whatever you want to call it, problem is similar to one that you've experienced in the past, regardless of what the end user is, regardless of what the industry is, regardless of what, regardless of what the certification is. Um, I find that you, you need to be able to have strong relationships with your vendors. You need to have stronger relationships with your internal customers, engineers, quality, manufacturing people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I guess what I learned most from that job was just the adaptability requirements of a supply chain professional is one of the biggest assets you could possibly have. Being very good at managing stress. Yes, very much so. Yes, absolutely. 
So you mentioned they had an MRP. Does this mean they did not have an ERP system in place? Um, yes. Yes, it does. I have interacted with more people than I can imagine that are on QuickBooks. Yeah. Or using Excel spreadsheets to run a oh. multi-million dollar business. Well, yes. And I could talk about that but we don't have enough time on this podcast. <laughs> Let me just say that one of my biggest um, skills is Excel. <laughs> Ridiculously well-versed in Excel. You're an Excel master. Um, and not because I wanted to be, because I had to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you have pivoted in your career now and you're doing something a little bit different and that you are actually a contractor. Yes. So talk to me about what you're doing now and would love to hear your thoughts on what it's like being a contractor. Sure. So I'm working as a contract buyer um, for a, a, a manufacturer of pharmaceutical equipment in Durham, North Carolina. Um, it's kind of, um, as far as the job goes, the actual job itself goes, it's kind of going back to more tactical buying mm -hmm. and certainly has a much more stable demand profile, uh, much better systems, easier to plan, all that kind of stuff. Um, as far as being a contractor's concerned, it's new to me. I've never done it in my entire career. Every time I've worked for a company, I've been very invested in the company that I've worked for. I've always had a passion for the companies that I've worked for. I think that's important for to be successful. So it's slightly different. Having said that, it doesn't change my mindset in terms of wanting to be successful for the company I'm working for, even though I'm there as a contractor. It just adds a little bit of um, lack of stability into the mindset. Um, however, um, I I'm glad I'm doing it um, and I'm very happy with the situation. I just, um, it's just a, because it's new for me, I'm a little bit, um, I'm kind of learning as I go. But but overall, I would say it doesn't change a single thing about how I go about my day-to-day -day, um, work. It, it doesn't, you know. Um, yeah, I have, I have a lot of friends who are contractors and some have their own business and I, I think the hardest part for them is the sales and marketing piece, which you don't have to worry about because yeah, absolutely. you don't yeah. have your own business. So yeah, it makes that, that piece a little bit easier. Sure. Yeah. So Craig, when we were prepping for the show, you had mentioned that the biggest problem by far that, that you encountered over the past couple years has been global freight. Yes. So I want to dive into this. I think this is really relevant and important to a lot of our listeners who are working for small and mid-sized manufacturers who are still struggling this with this. So yeah. let's start with why was this problem so unexpected? Why did it kind of come out of nowhere for you? Okay, so I wouldn't say that it was unexpected, the problem itself. What I would say is that the extent of the problem was unexpected. You know, like when, when COVID initially hit, it wasn't just freight, there was a problem. There was there was worldwide supply chain problems, uh, lots to do with um, staff not being able to get to work, uh, creating shortages of materials. But with freight, um, it was a combination of staff problems at ports, uh, lack of um lack of a uh, people that could run container ships lack of a uh, global air freight because a lot of a lot of air freight is done on commercial flights and the, the number of commercial flights was a fraction of what it had been prior to that so the surprise wasn't so much that it was a problem it was how big a problem it became so for example um we saw our freight times, our, our sea freight times from Asia and Europe move from what had always been typically four to six weeks to 16 to 18 weeks. 
which is impossible to react which to. is unimaginable if you were to tell crazy. me that five years ago five yeah. years ago i would say absolutely not, never no, no way it, exactly that, that was just it, it, it's incredible it was incredible i mean it was a, a and initially you couldn't react to it because you hadn't planned for it so um that was the the biggest surprise for me was the extent of the change in lead time so other than that, what freight problems did you encounter? You already talked about the extended lead times, but there was a lot of other things that, that came up as well. Well, yeah, I, I, I kind of touched on it there. So what, 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 what you did, what you tried to do to react to the sea freight times was obviously, as all supply chain professionals know, well, you need to fly it. And then you couldn't do that either. And then it was cost. The cost was through the roof, you know, like in, even if you could secure freight, costs were doubling, trebling. And these are items that are already on order for fixed price manufacturing contracts. Mm -hmm. So there's not really an opportunity to recover these costs. It's all coming off the bottom line. So, uh, yeah, I mean... It, it was crazy. I, I I would say, and hopefully um, your listeners will see the same thing, it's improved drastically over the last year, maybe, last certainly the last six months. I'm not seeing the same issues that we had back then. But uh, being able to react to it was the biggest problem. Finding it, you know, trying to understand what you could actually do about it. And as a direct material supply chain professional, I find that um, you take it personally when you can't support the business, you know, and even when it's I, even when it's an issue like that that's completely out with your control, you still feel personally responsible for it. So, so what did you do? Well, what we the, the only thing we really could do, um, and again, it came back to planning. If we know it's going to take sixteen weeks to ship something you can add 16 weeks to the lead time of the part in your system. Um, data accuracy is huge. We, we had to make sure that our parts lead times were extended so that our MRP signals were hitting us earlier. Um, that was a little bit more of a kind of going forward issue rather than fixing the the current problems. But we did that. You have, you have to, we had to do that. We had to react. So yeah, I mean, just extending lead times on parts um, in our system so that we get our buy signals earlier. And the other thing was planning from a planning perspective, trying to plan for container loads, you know, trying to consolidate requirements from certain parts of the world to ensure that, you know, when we did have something to ship, we were taking, a, you know, the most economical method of doing it, given the, the increased cost. I would also add the other wrench in the planning mix was your data was no longer relevant. Absolutely. So what you Absolutely. used to be looking at from your MRP or ERP and making strategic decisions, you almost couldn't even go off historical data. And it was hard yeah. to predict the future because of COVID and the unknown yeah. buying behaviors. Yeah. And, 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 like, yeah, and it's easy to say, just add 10 week lead time to a part to get a buy signal earlier. When you do that, when you're in the middle of it, it gives you that buy signal three months ago. <laughs> you know, there's not much you can do about that. But gradually over time, if you if you take the time to plan like that, you eventually can um, make some sort of uh, inroads into the problem. Mm -hmm. So what advice do you have for our listeners who are still struggling with global freight right now? You mentioned a positive, which is always awesome to hear when things improve. Things have gotten pretty, well, I mean, nothing's perfect, but significantly better, I would sure. say, over the last few months. But what about people who still are having challenges? Any words of wisdom that you can share? Well, yeah, I touched on it in my previous answer. Definitely ensure that your planning lead times are current 
get and have knowledge, have a total understanding of what your current freight time are. Um, avoid air freight like the plague if you can. Um, partner with good logistics companies. There's nothing more important than that. And that's something that we found very valuable when we were going through that. Making sure we had good relationships with the companies that we deal with in the logistics side to make sure that we were getting the best opportunities, the, the best situation in a bad situation, if you like. So partnerships with excellent logistics companies is invaluable when it comes to handling these sort of issues. But overall, certainly planning um, is a big a big part of it. And as you say, the positive is that it's nowhere near like the situation it was a couple of years ago. Um, but, you know, we never know what's around the corner. It could go back to that. So just data is a big part of it. Making sure that you're, if you have a good partner, a good logistics partner, that they constantly keep you up to date. We used to get weekly uh, updates on shipping times, container capacity, air freight capacity. Data, data, data. I mean, it's boring, but it's it's important. So what learnings do you want to share with our audience from your career? You've, you've been in the industry a long time. I've worked yeah. at several global companies, a lot in manufacturing and in, in the direct material space. Um, overall, um, when dealing with suppliers, um, I would say relationships is number one, building relationships, partnerships. Um, when I first started in purchasing, there was some old school people that were bang the table types. They love to get on the phone and just scream down the phone at suppliers. That doesn't work anymore. It's not, it, it doesn't work like that. I've, I've worked in situations where the suppliers I'm dealing with, our business to them is like 0.01% of our total output. And, and then the flip side of that, I've worked with suppliers where our business to them is like 80% of their entire output. Both of them are polar opposites in terms of supply dynamics, but both are equally important. Um, and the only way to handle them is relationships. I do not like dealing with either. If honest, and, and honestly, I prefer the former rather than the latter. I don't think any vendor should be very, you know, um, dependent on one company's business. And, and I used to tell these suppliers that, but if it's good business, they're going to want to keep it. Um, but just relationships. I, I went through some very, very, very complex uh, supply situations when I was working in oil and gas. Um, in the oil and gas industry, OCTG is king. The, the, the steel mills supply oil country tubular goods churn out that stuff day in, day out, miles of it. And we were buying a fraction of that from the same companies. If we didn't have relationships with these companies, we wouldn't have been able to get supply. So relationships is the key. I think suppliers are your most important stakeholder. And if yes. they're not, they should be. Absolutely. 100%. 100%. I'll, I'll often say that it's like, uh, you know, you've got a plant manager in the facility but your job's to be like a plant manager of 20 facilities <laughs> you know yeah that's a that's a good one it's a good example what about a success that you'd like to share from your career um oh i, I think there's there's been a lot there has been a lot of successes i i think yeah uh, i've had a lot of fantastic negotiations over the years for big contracts, made very significant savings, particularly when I was working in the oil and gas industry. Um, like the oil and gas industry, for any of your listeners that are involved in it will know this, is very volatile. It's, it's a boom and bust. And when it's booming, everything, you can't get anything quick enough and money isn't an object. Get it here, get it here, get it here. And then when it goes to bust and it happens overnight, you have to stop everything just like that. And it's like trying to turn an ocean liner 
uh, on a dime. It's just impossible. So um, I had a lot of success managing inventory levels uh, to a certain within a certain um, area when we were going through the downturns. I think most of my successes in my career have been when the business has been on the downside. Um, and again, that comes back to having relationships with the suppliers that will work with you. Um, I'm very proud to say that despite all the downturns I've seen, I've never ever actually had to cancel a purchase order. But I have... Never ever in your entire career have you had never. to cancel a PO? Never. You might be the first person I've met that's been able to say that. I've never cancelled a PO. I've had suppliers who work with me and held on to material, sometimes for over a year. But I've committed to, if they do that for me, I will um, take the material eventually because I knew that we would eventually need it. I feel like this should be the highlight on your LinkedIn profile. Yes. <laughs> I'll tell you yeah. what, you would stand out. <laughs> well, thank you for discussing how to deal with global freight issues with me today, Craig. Where would you like to send people to find you? Uh, you can find me at LinkedIn, uh, Craig Campbell. I'm also on Twitter, um, so you can search and find me on there. And my personal email is craig2402 at att.net. If you missed anything, you can check out the show notes. You can find us by typing in What the Duck, another supply chain podcast in Google. To have optimal search results, make sure to add another supply chain podcast in your search. To ensure you don't miss a single episode, make sure to follow this podcast and subscribe to us on YouTube. I'm at Sarah Scudder on LinkedIn and at S. Scudder on Twitter. This brings us to the end of another episode of What the Duck, another supply chain podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Scudder, and we'll be back next week. <laughs> <laughs>